Welcome to the official Lost Podcast. In today's installment, we talk with Matthew Fox, Evangeline Lilly, and Terry O'Quinn about their favorite moments from Season 1. We'll also check in with executive producers Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse to discuss last week's shocking episode, Abandoned, as well as what we can expect from this week's thrilling departure, The Other 48 Days. Now that we're well into season two of Lost, we thought it might be fun to stop for a second and look back at some of the favorite moments from season one through the eyes of several of our castaways. Yes, it's like asking a mother to choose her favorite child, but we figured Matthew Fox, Evangeline Lilly, and Terry O'Quinn would be up for the task. Of course, it depends how you define favorite moment, and how you define define. Are we talking about emotional moments on the show, or scenes that were so physically challenging you can't help but remember them? Evangeline Lilly, who plays the alluring Kate, answered it both ways. For me, doing the emotional work is so exhausting and so draining. Doing the stunts, it's also exhausting and draining, but sort of in an invigorating way. So those are usually pretty, uh, pretty fun days for me on set, but then when I watch the show, in hindsight... I think some of my favorite moments have come from the really emotional moments in the show. And uh, I think probably my number one favorite moment in season one was um, when Jack and Kate find Charlie strung up in the tree. And, and everyone believes that he's dead. And they pan back for that moment of dead silence. Almost like we're just standing around his corpse at a funeral. No. No. Jack! 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 Come on! <laughs> and, and everybody's convinced that he's dead. And it's so tragic and it's so wrong in every sense of the word. And then all of a sudden there's this, this new life. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's back again. And, And it's just the redemption that comes in that. And I know I use that word a lot for the show, but I I really believe that's a main theme in this show. That people, I think people in that moment, I know I did, wept from joy more than they were weeping for sadness when we thought he was dead. When we thought he was dead, it was just this utter shock and devastation. But then there's this emotional rush that comes when you find out he's alive. And I think that's probably, I mean, I cried. I cried watching it. And, And I... It was a scene that I, you know, it was so involved with that it seemed silly that I was able to watch it and be emotionally unattached from it as an actor, but that was a neat moment. Terry O'Quinn, who plays Locke, also found the emotional moments to be the most satisfying. I think some of my favorite moments from season one, I mean, there are two sets of favorite moments. There are favorite moments that I participated in on the set, and there are favorite moments that I watched on the television. Um, And they weren't always the same favorite moments. I mean, some of my favorite scenes were... Some of the scenes in Walkabout were this, this, the, the end of Walkabout blew me away where, the, where the, it was revealed that Locke was in a wheelchair and, and the, we were burning a plane and <clears throat> the, when he first stood up, that, I wasn't aware when we shot it that it was going to be powerful and I thought it was powerful. But I enjoyed scenes where I got to sit down and talk with uh, other characters, with other actors, with Matthew and uh, an episode called White Rabbit where he was chasing his father and we were talking about being a leader and we were in the jungle. Someone. The White Rabbit. Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. Wonderland because who I'm chasing, he's not there. But you see him? Yes. But he's not there. And if I came to you and said the same thing, then what would your explanation be as a doctor? I'd call it an hallucination. A result of dehydration, post-traumatic stress, not getting more than two hours of sleep a night for the past week, all the above. All right, then you're hallucinating. But what if you're not? In a scene with, scenes with Dominic where he was fighting the, the addiction battle. and I like the scenes where, where my character gets to tell a story and make a point. Of course, every group has a lone dissenter. In this case, Matthew Fox, a.k.a. Dr. Jack Shepard. He opted for the answer, let's get physical. I've enjoyed all the, all the action stuff on the show. I mean, I suppose that whole swimming sequence I really enjoyed, although I got sicker than hell that day. Um, but that was the most physically demanding thing I've ever done. 
uh, as far as in, t in telling story. Scott! Jack! Hey, Jack! There's someone out there! You got it! The current! What? There's someone out there! Look! I woke up and it's just... I don't swim! And, you know, I have some really fond memories of that day because I, I really, I got seasick and I was, you know, throwing up all over the place and there were so many interesting moments in that day because of how the guys that were helping me out there, like on jet skis and stuff, and these are guys that live in Hawaii and they're very, very athletic and they're incredibly, you know, capable in the water. <laughs> And they're watching me out there, supposed to be rescuing people and being very heroic, and um, and I'm puking my guts off of a boogie board, and and just watching them like you know react to that, but try not to show me their reactions to. Yeah! Someone else still out there. On a side note, despite his love for skinny dipping, Matthew Fox was clothed during the filming of that scene, but does that mean he'll always stay that way? Perhaps that's a question for the writers. Which brings us to the heart of why we're here, namely what happened last week in the episode Abandoned. As we all know, there was a shocking ending with someone's death. Just a warning, folks, if you haven't seen the episode and don't want the surprise ruined, stop this podcast now. All right, now we continue on as we once again join executive producers Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse to discuss the upcoming episode, The Other 48 Days. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Carlton Cuse. And I'm Damon Lindelof. And here we are on the second uh, ever podcast for Lost. Isn't it the second podcast ever? Yes. This is our all. second podcast okay. ever. So uh, we want to talk a little bit about the other 48 days, um, which uh, Damon and I actually authored. And uh, That's a fancy word for wrote. <laughs> <laughs> we wrote and... Uh, we, uh, yeah, so we, we, uh, this episode was sort of a, uh, kind of a concept episode, and it's a little bit different than some of the other, uh, episodes on the show. Yeah, um, we don't want to spoil too much about it, but, uh, you know, but obviously the idea that, uh, at, at any, any, I've already seen promos that probably show everything that happens. So. Do you think? No. Maybe. But at least a few, some of the things. Probably. Yeah. But I think that the idea that, you know, every episode of Lost, you know, focuses on one character and that character has flashbacks and, and all that stuff every once in a while you know it's our instinct to sort of shake up the format of the show so that it keeps people guessing and you never know what you're going to get any given week and we we feel that this episode is sort of uh you know not quite an entire departure from what we've done on the show before but certainly we'll give audiences uh you know a look at uh at a different side of the show and, you know, we, we thought it would be kind of a cool idea that, you know, obviously there's uh, the re big repercussions of Shannon's death uh, in last week's episode. And instead of coming back and, and immediately dealing with the aftermath of Shannon's death, that we would sort of take a jump back in time and um, give the audience more details about what happened during the, the other 48 days. That this other group of, uh, we know that there were these tailies, which is what we refer to the uh, other survivors who were in the tail section, how we refer to them. Um, they've, they've had their own existence for 48 days, and we wanted to sort of explain in this episode how their, different, how their experience was a lot different than our fuselage survivors. And obviously doing that over, the, you know, over, over just a single hour uh, episode, you know, it was fairly challenging in terms of constructing. It's almost like a clip show for a show that you, you've never seen. Um, you're just picking up moments in their in their existence and what moments you show and, and what stories you tell and what emotional moments you show for the characters bonding. Cause I think one of the things that we always try to do on, on lost is, you know, introduce a character in one way where they might be unsympathetic, um, and then explain to you how, how they got to be that way. Um, and, uh, and, and I think the tail section people are very mysterious and, you know, and obviously they've been sort of at odds with, you know, we don't like it when people kick Sawyer around or punch him and, and, Hopefully, if we begin to explain how they got to be that way and what their experiences have been since the crash, you know, we might... Uh... Particularly Anna Lucia. I mean, I think that the audience will, in the in the course of the next few episodes, really start to see her, perhaps, in a little bit of a different light. And it's one of the things that we try to do on the show, which is we sort of set up an expectation for a character, and then we like to try to challenge whatever that first expectation is that you have for for that character by giving you more information that maybe helps you come to a different conclusion. 
Um, you know, at the beginning of the, of last season, Sawyer was not a very popular character, and uh, but I think over time, as the audience sort of learned more about him and who it, who he was and what his story was, you know, their impression of the character changed a lot. Um, so, do you want to talk about uh, Shannon's death at all? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think you know, whenever we, uh, you know, whenever we decide that it's time for a character to die on the show, that's a really hard decision that you know that we put a lot of time and, and thought into in terms of whose death will sort of turn the story the way that it needs to be turned. And, you know, in much the same way that we decided to uh, to kill Boone last year, it was, uh, it was not, it, it was big picture thinking in terms of Boone's death would really sort of, you know, light the fire under the Jack-Locke conflict. You know, Locke basically being responsible for Boone's death, lying about it. But also it sort of, it, it sort of would force Shannon into sort of a more, you know, adult existence on the island because she had been tethered to her brother for so long and now this, it sort of freed her up to be with, you know, Saeed. So now in much the same way we, when we were talking this year about, you know, uh, character, you know, w- which character's death would really emotionally uh, and profoundly affect all the other survivors, we sort of came up with Shannon in terms of that would sort of sp- spin Saeed off into another direction. Yeah. But, but also, you know, the fact that her death would happen at the hands of Anna Lucia enforced this very sort of, you know, messy conflict between, um, you know, the tailies and, and our fuselage folk, especially because it, for all intents and purposes, at least the way that we're looking at it from last week's episode, it, it could have been an accident. In fact, it looks very much like that. So it, it just becomes a very, um, you know, interesting conflict for them to, to be yeah, dealing and with. And obviously when, uh, when, you know, when we actually take the story to its next step, I mean, what what happens between Saeed and, and Shannon is going to be a very big part of uh, of, of that ongoing story. And uh, again, I, you know, Shannon's death will have repercussions that will last over a whole series of episodes and really inform um, the merge between these two groups of uh, of survivors. And also, just a, you know, a word about sort of Maggie's performance in last week's episode. You know, awesome, like she was just unbelievable, and yeah. you know, jet. You just sit, so you sort of get to this really emotional level of the character, and you finally understand. Okay, this is why she was the way she was, and then she's gone. And I think, you know, I, I I think what's been probably fairly hard for Maggie as an actress is her character is a bitch. You know, we wrote her that way. You know, for an entire season. So you know, and intentionally. She, I mean, we needed someone to kind of push against. You know, it's always you always need some source of opposition and character conflict, and. And she unfortunately had to, you know, kind of carry that as as her assignment as an actor on the show. And then last week she sort of got this opportunity to really show a lot of different colors. And you know, I, you know, when we we were sitting in the editing room and we see that moment where she dies, it's just I really felt, you know, th- this, you know, this intense emotional sense of loss. I think we sort of looked at each other and said, "Wow, I, you know, we kind of, maybe we, <laughs> we shouldn't, have, maybe we shouldn't have done this," you know? know. But hopefully that's the the audience has sort of had the same reaction. All right, should we do a few questions here? I, I, I wish we uh, we would. I'd like to ask you this first question okay. because I know this is one that you're sort of personally invested in. Jate Forever, which is apparently Jate is, you know, the sort of com- combination of Jack and Kate. So it's just sort of shortened. It's like, you know, Kirk and Spock would be, well, Kirk Spock. Spurk or, the, or, or something else, which I will not say on the podcast. <laughs> No. If the Spurk alternate. <laughs> Don't say it. I'm not going to say it, but if it weren't Spurk, it would be <laughs> uh, okay. something else. I think so anyway, people's Jade, imaginations Jade, are yes, good enough. Jade Forever asks, will Jack and Kate get together this season? Well, Jade Forever, thank you for your question. And the answer is uh, a qualified yes. Uh, and sort of. A, yeah. uh, well, that's I not mean, quite a qualified yes. I mean, but they'll... They're yes, they are. they are. I mean, you know... Damon is, is giving me a hard time because I am, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm always very, like, focused on these, this whole romantic triangle part of the show. And it's definitely something which we just never really felt like we had a chance to get to because of the intensity of what was going on sort of narratively last season. But this season, um, we're definitely getting to it. So, yes, you can expect some, some things to heat up between Jack and Kate. Uh, which we've kind of been playing with already, sort of yeah. moving forwards. And, you know, I mean, I think... With Sawyer on the other side of the island, you know... It's, we, it's, we didn't have any of the nude swim races, though. That's true. No. But, um, there is much more along the lines in the, in the whole Kate, Jack, Sawyer triangle, and then 
um, actually Ana Lucia kind of coming in to sort of make it a quadrangle is very much going to be a part of the show moving forward. Okay. So uh, now, how about a question for you? Are Please, you ready? I would love it if you'd ask one. Okay, Black Rock Down asks, and I Black Rock Down. I, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I guess it's sort of like Black Hawk Down, except you know, Black Rock Down. But that's a clever play on that right, because exactly. our, the ship on our island. For those of you not familiar with the finale, they find a big pot, sort of pot. It looks like a pirate vessel, but it's actually a. Uh, it's a. It's an eighteen. Yeah, it's like an early nineteen. It's like an eight nineteenth century. Uh, Sailing ship. Frigate? Can I say that? <laughs> I don't know. Is it it's a, a frigate? It might be a clipper. It could be a clipper. It's a big ship it's, in the middle of the jungle. And it's uh, it's nowhere near water. It's out in the middle of the island. and There's uh, dynamite on there. There's uh, And a bunch of mining equipment. Uh, it's where Arched blows up. And there were slaves uh, chained inside it. Yes. And uh, it is a, it remains one of our standing mysteries, which is what was, you know, we, there's more to be learned about the Black Rock and why it came to be in the middle of the island and how it relates to the story. So here's the question, Damon. Yeah. Were the various wrecks and strandings on the island caused by the same thing? Wow, that's a big one. Um, I, I, you know, I, I would say uh, sort of globally, yes. I mean, they are, they are caused by the same thing. What that... You know what that thing is is just as mysterious as sort of where why there's a higher incident of crashes in the area that's the Bermuda Triangle. But uh, but I think that the reason that uh, the island draws uh, people and things to it is you know is a is a sort of universal thing as opposed to a series of arbitrary things or, or accidents. Um, so yes, I would I, I guess that that's was it. good. That that's was, it. Is it know, sort of answered it without really answering. answering it. I know, which is which is pretty that's much all we, we can do because can, can I ask you yes. a question though, yes. Carlton? Lost fan O five lib underscore lib asks because I guess Lost fan O five was already taken, <laughs> so you had to do the you, you know the. Asks, I think that's 05, the fifth fan, or like 2005. I think, I don't know. I'm okay. going to go with 2005. Okay. But um, that's just me. Some folks analyze every minute detail of the show. No. Is this really necessary to understand the plot of the show? For example, if one doesn't read The Third Policeman, will it affect their overall, <laughs> uh, overall understanding of the show? I'm, uh, la- I'm laughing because <laughs> neither of us have read, read the third, third policeman. policeman. We know what it's about, though, and we hear yes. it's very good. One of uh, one of uh, our writers on the show was uh, what had read the third policeman and was a very uh, very literate uh, fellow named Craig Wright, and um, so uh, but we haven't read it, and so therefore. You probably don't have to read The Third Policeman. To Carlton and I membership. only read books with pictures in them, <laughs> pretty much. Exactly. Um, and uh, so you, you really don't. I think that the, um, you know, you, there, there are a lot of minute details, and obviously we have our Easter eggs that we bury and we hide in the show, but I think you can, you can enjoy the show on many levels. It's like a baseball game. You can go to a baseball game, and if you don't know anything about baseball, you can watch people hit the ball and run and score runs. If you're really into baseball, you can look at a particular ma- pitching matchup and you know what about a pitcher and how what he throws to, to a certain batter and, and you can somehow appreciate the game on a much deeper level because you understand the participants and you but but you could still enjoy that same game whether you're you have an in-depth knowledge or whether you have a, uh, less of a knowledge. So um, again, maybe for the p- podcast fans for um, this second week too, can you just kind of summarize what's happened in the series so far, Damon? Yeah, again, just to sort of break it down. There's a plane crash. A lot of people uh-huh. freaked out. Monster, jungle, uh, lock, wheelchair, uh-huh. healed, jack, Good. dead body. Good. Sees coffin, water. Good. Charlie, heroin. Yes, very important. Saeed finds a wire. Uh-huh. Uh, wire. There's a crazy French woman. Crazy, she, she very steals, crazy. She steals a baby. Uh-huh. They get the Smoke. baby. They get the baby back. There's a, there's a monster that is Smoke sort of monster. that smoky, too, and... There's a hatch. They go in there. Um, and there's a dude. Dude in the hatch. They're push, pushing a button every 108 minutes or he, or the world will end or so he's told. So There we go. Okay. That's pretty much it. So now you're all set to roll into the other 48 days. So thank you, Damon. Thank you, Carlton. And uh, we'll talk to you guys later. Yay. And that concludes our second podcast. Join us next week for an exclusive interview with one of the mysterious tale section survivors, actress Cynthia Watros, who plays the character Libby. Remember, you can get additional content and submit your own fan questions for Cynthia or the writers at lost.abc.com.